Good morning, everybody. Hopefully everybody has a great start of the week. Uh, my charge today is to discuss our TFCC injuries of the wrist, a very specific type of injury, and we'll take a, a deep dive into it. So one of the things uh, with TFCC injuries, we know they're, they're a very common cause of owner sided wrist pain in the wrist. We know the prevalence of having some form of wear and tear in the TFCC increases with age, I mean, kind of like a rotator cuff degenerative type tear. We know there's a 49% prevalence in patients of 70 years or older that all have some form of changes in their TFCC complex if they were imaged under MRI. We also know that once you get to 30 years old, uh, about 20% of the patients do have some form of changes in their TFCCs. But basically, the two main functions of the TFCC are, one, to anchor the radius, the carpus, and the hand as one unit to the fixed ulna, and also to help with low transmission across the radial carpal joint. So that's two main functions, and it definitely makes it propensity to injury, and that's what we'll discuss some of the treatment options for this injury. Like anything we treat in plan and upper extremity surgery, we need to really understand the anatomy. Uh, we, what we're talking about is a complex, meaning that it has multiple structures that make the, that complex. Uh, we know it originates from the radius and attaches to the base of the owner's styloid. There's two specific areas to the styloid and as well as to the, to the fovea, which we'll discuss. It's been studied in, in the sense of histological components. It's composed of a central cartilaginous disc, and both the radial and ulnar ligaments have fairly well-aligned parallel collagen fibers that extend both on the boulder and the dorsal side. We know the thickness varies across its insertion sites. At its mid portion, where it lines up into the lunate, it's the thinnest, it's between four and five millimeter. But as it goes into the periphery, and also with variance of on a minus on a plus, it does change in thickness. This landmark study uh, done by Nakamura in 2001 basically delineated the hammock concept of the TFCC. Uh, and basically, he was the one that was able to show that it basically presented as a hammock that the TFCC, and not only as a load bearing structure in the ulnar aspect of the wrist, but also suspended and supported the ulnar carpus. He was able to define the ligamentum subcurato, uh, both extending both the deep portions of the TFCC that are both palmar and volar. And he looked at the histological analysis, and he was able to demonstrate that the radial side attaches to hyaline cartilage, like many areas in the body, it does, he did, was able to show a transitional zone going from you know, fibrous tissue to a, in, leading into the sharpie fibers at the fovea. He was able to show that the ulnar side attachment to some degree had bone attachment, but that the ono lunate and the ono triclitoral ligaments originated on the palmar side of the TFCC. And that was, this is uh, very important as we're able to know that there were some areas of healing and that the changes in the insertions of transition varied. If you look at the histopathology as we understand the treatment, and this is another landmark article, Haggard and Garcia Elias, they looked at the different components of the TFCC and their histopathology. The TFCC disc, uh, it was known to be a vascular in the mid portion, and the vessels were mainly on the ulnar aspect when they did have some, but mainly were in the periphery in about 40, 50% of the cases. They see a subsheet that does com compose the dorsal aspect of the TFCC, and it had a combination of loose and tight parallel collagen. The ulno lunate and ulno tricrito ligaments uh, were less elastic, and they had that extension that originated from the volar portion of the TFCC, not necessarily from the ulna in itself, as the name implies. The dorsal and volar discs or radial ulnar ligaments have parallel collagen fiber, and the meniscal homolog that you'll see referred is basically that ulnar collateral extension, which is mainly composed of uh, connective tissue. As we see here, the, the vascular component uh, comes from mainly from the periphery, kind of like a meniscus. Yeah, it's through the interosseous artery, and it tends to vary within literature as you look for it between 40 and 60 percent of that periphery. The central portion is a vascular, and the nutrition to the central portion is by synovial inhibition. And this is usually something that is tested and asked. As we look at the TFCC before we go into treatment, I think it's very important to understand the imaging because it's something we want as we start as young hand surgeons looking at the imaging. This is something that we need to understand. We still know that the wrist arthroscopy is the gold standard of making the diagnosis. Uh, 
But you, when we look at MRIs, we have to look at in three planes because the anatomy varies from dorsal to volar, from radial to one direction in the thickness as mentioned. And then in particular, our arthrogram is not always needed. And this study by Bohr et al., they showed that it was minimally better. So, you know, and this is also compared relative to arthroscopy. One of the things of the pearls that I've learned over the years is specific things to look with these MRI. One is the pre-siloed recess, which is a normal structure. And it looks like a tear, but it's not. Usually a, it's not a tear. Look at the cartilage. Uh, especially on the owner's siloed, they can have a signal intensity that can be misread as a partial tear. Try to identify the ligament subcreatum as well as the steep fibers, because usually you'll have the intact superficial fibers, and I'll show you pictures of that. The radio attachment usually has signal, but usually has cartilage into it. So that's one of the things you need not be confused as a tear. And the central disc does have intermediate signal. So if you were to look at this image right here, you can see uh, we're, with my arrow, as we're seeing here, the deep fibers extending here. And these are what, what comp compose the stability of the DRA in sending into the fovea and then superficial attachment. We have that ulnar collateral extension that extends and has these loose connected fibers and it's a capsule type extension extending into the triclitrum and into the ulnar side. And this right here, as we're showing the signal intensity where we can see here on the on the radial side. And again, this is a, a central cut and this is more of a dorsal cut in the coronal plane of the view. And as we move forward and examining the MRI, it's very important to also, as you image in the, in the clinic, to do grip pronator views because that'll basically delineate your variance. And we know for a fact that variance and thickness of TSUC correspond. The, the less ulnar variance that you have, the thicker the TSUC tends to be compared when you're on a plus or, you know, have a, more, a positive variance, it tends to be thinner. And these are the people patients that are tend to be predisposed to degenerative type tears and to issues with the TFCC. And it's important to use this in grip pronated view in evaluation in, of your patients with these ulnar sided wrist TFCC injuries. Uh, don't forget to look at the ECU. And this is a supinated view there on the left side compared to on the right side, which is a pronated view. Because a lot of TFCCs in my practice that I tend to see that have failed treatment have been treated is that they did not address the ECU. So always be mindful of looking at the ECU and also look for interticular tears within the TFCC between the ECU, which is very common. Don't forget like, get to look at the LT and why do I mention that? Because it varies in how it presents and this is just how it may be look, but usually there's a significant high signal intensity. And then when you're scoping that's uh, doing a risk scope, do look for the TFC to the owner to the lunar tracheal because definitely you'll have some associated pathology. And these are just different patterns of the LT how it's seen in the MRI. One of the things is we talked about tears. If you look at the owner collateral portion capsular extension, what they call here in the meniscal homolog, don't forget to look at the periphery out here. These are very typical of capsular type tears. And these are very painful. They create a lot of inflammation, not necessarily instability, but these are the ones that we debris in. And when we have this extension, this is when the capsule repair does seem to work well in response. So always look at these views and don't just look in the central portion here, but look at the capsule extensions. Again, as discussed and has been discussed in the, in the ICL of this past SSH meeting is looking at the, the deep portions. And you can see a good example here of that deep portion that's torn and where the arrow points compared to the superficial fibers. And these are the ones that present with subtle instability. And this is something that has changed in, in my practice as we understand that addressing these as a foliar repair better than a capsule repair is what addresses the pathology. If you look in general, and this study that was done for Mayo, um, you know, the biggest thing is, is when you're looking at your MRI, also look at the position of the ulnar head relative to the radius or the radius relative to the ulna, because usually if they have some subtle subluxation, they may have some instability. And some of these patients, you know, do present an MRI position on the pronation view that they'll have a specific subluxation, either dorsally or orally. They looked at, you know, patients that had folio tears compared to those that did not have any pathology. And about 16% of the patients that have folio tears have significant subluxation of the ulna in MRI. So that's something to correlate with your clinical exam as you go in also arthroscopically. For the physical exam, we know the injury is usually an extension and pronation with an actually loaded wrist. Uh, 
They pay the same with pain with ulnar deviation, rotation of the wrist, gripping, decreased grip strength. And usually it's common in ulnar neutral, ulnar positive. So again, remember the ulnar positive, thinner TFCC, more likely to develop some form of injury. And as mentioned, the thicker uh, TFCC articular discs are noted on one of minus patients. If you look at the exam, one of the key exams, and I'll show you a video of this, is the fovea exam, which we ex use and palpate between the ECU and the FCU. And these are suggestive mainly of ulnar triquetral tears or deep TFCC involvement, which we'll mention. The ballotment test in some areas is also referred as a piano key sign. It assesses the DRJ stability, and you have to do this both in pronation and supination. Um, if we were to, to look at this right here, this is a, the fovea exam, and I think it's a very good example of what we're seeing here. And, and one of the things, I don't know if it's, if it's plain, can you guys hear? Yeah. Okay, so as you can see, she's pointing. I'll let her, can you guys hear the talk? Yes. Okay. Can't hear her anymore. Okay. Still no. Okay. So as she's demonstrating is between the ECU and the FCU, and basically this is the fovea exam, and it's basically that pressure right there. They'll be they'll have a exquisite pain as they demonstrate. One of the other ones that that we see uh, as we move forward is the press test, which is uh, you know it's basically these are exams with the wrist at maximal pronation and supination. The press test is we ask the patient to lift themselves out of a chair using the wrist in the extended position. And usually pain does indicate positive test. The supination test is basically when you ask the patient to grab the underside with the patient fully supinated, the forearms, and that causes pain in the TFCC in the dorsal aspect. This is an example of the press test being shown here. Um, and this is an, an, an example of the patient be, being asked to place the palms and you put some resistance. And this is what is known as the uh, supination lift test. And it basically addresses that TFCC. And this is one way you do it with the patient and elbow flex at 90 degrees in the form supinated. And that leads to, to pain and they'll report pain to that dorsal aspect. Or you can even do it with you doing the resistive pressure. And that can basically work that way. And again, this is the press test as, as well, as well as compared to, with the lift test. And again, there are maximal pronation and supination. One of the things is that you have to check for stability of the DRJ when we're examining the TFCC, because we know in pronation, the ulnar head tends to lie dorsal. And when we stress it, the volar radial and ligaments tend to become tight. And when these ruptures, they're the ones that actually lead to the subluxation dorsally of the on our head. In supination, the on our head tends to lie volarly, and then the deep radial ulnar ligaments are what's tight, and these ruptures, it dislocates volarly. And this comes with this example here as where they come in either volarly or dorsally. And this is a great article by Haggard and Al, and basically it was in 1994, but definitely is a landmark article in understanding this mechanics. One of the things is just remember that in pronation, the on our head tends to lie dorsally, and the, and the sigmoid notch of the radius, basically the radius moves along the fixed ulna. And when it happens in pronation, the volar portion of it tends to be tight, preventing it from the subluxing dorsally the ulna. And that's what ruptures in instability, and that's what you have to assess. And it's the opposite in supination. In supination, we have the volar deep portions um, that are de definitely the dorsal deep, the dorsal portions that are tight and that prevents the supination. Just be mindful in these two pictures that we're showing the dorsal in, in the volar are flipped. So don't get confused on, on what's volar and what's dorsal. And that's kind of tricky when you guys are looking at these pictures. And this does correlate. So one of the things is to understand that the deep portions of the, of the TFCC in some form of pronation, supination, or in mid arc, they're going to be tight those deep fibers, because they're the ones controlling that on our head. So when they detach from the fovea, you'll have progressive 
subtle instability to full instability, and you have to address that in your reconstruction. Again, assess at the extremes of pronation supination. This is as it was taught to us by Kleinman. In pronation, you're testing the volar ligament, and in supination, dorsal ligament. And if you can see the white arrow, the yellow arrow is pushing on the radius on the left hand volarly and stressing the ulna dorsally, and on the right side is stressing the radius dorsally and stressing the volar ulnar ligaments orally. And this is an easy test that you can complement with your TFCC assessment to assess for subtle instability of the TFCC. We know arthroscopy is a physical like standard. Uh, one of the things is the trampoline test, and we'll mention that. It may be misleading in dry scope because of the lack of resilience. The hook test, and the hook test, if it's asked in Can't hear you, Cesar. Cesar, we lost your audio. Can you guys hear me now? You're back. You're back. Okay. Sorry about that. I think my headphones were died. But yes, so we were in the trampoline effects that it does lose the buoyancy and it doesn't have a much of a response. And this is another of the pull technique here being shown on the right. If you look here, this is one of the things that um, that we can play here. This is showing the hook test as we move forward. And this is pulling from radial to owner in, in this view. And you can, you can see this is testing for the owner side as we're going right there. The trampoline test, as you can see here, just pushes that. That's a normal TFCC. That's a normal trampoline test, a good response and a buoyancy noted. And again, remember the, the hook test as we're coming in, pulling from, from owner to radio into our field of view. When that hooks into it, that leads to that, that TFCC portion. And again, this is the trampoline effect. And one of the things as we as we treat these, well, one is that initially, if you get to them early, there's always a trial non-op management that we should do, especially when they, these present with just a painful TFCC, but no gross instability. We recommend usually mobilizing between four and six weeks. But the important thing is that they do can heal or scar down and not become as painful and not be as painful. But definitely a Munster and a long arm splint is what we recommend to avoid that rotation. And when we get into the surgical options, that's when we discuss either debridement, repair, and based on the location. The Palmer classification, um, and there's a newer classification that has kind of complements the Palmer classification, but it's basically into traumatic and degenerative classes. The degenerative class is usually associated with ulnar impacts in the traumatic classes, what we'll mention today as we talked about the repair. These usually present either as a central tear, which is the 1A, Peripheral repair, usually we tend to repair these are the 1Bs. The 1C are the ones that involve the onolunate, onotricletral ligament on the volar portion. And the 1D are the radial sided tears. And we'll talk for specific tear location treatment options. The central TFCC lesions are fully vascularized. Um, arthroscopic treatments usually we what it's done. And you want to preserve that margin on the volar owner side because you don't want to create an instability getting into the radial ulnar ligaments. You can debride up to two thirds of the disc. We know the worst outcomes are with significant degenerative tears and patients with ONA plus variants. With those, when we debride, sometimes it'll be useful to go ahead and, 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 and include a diaphyseal ONA shortening procedure. The central tear, this is an example of a central tear. As we're seeing, we're probing into the, the tear in itself, and you can see it's a good flap, and the flap in itself is what creates that response. And that response to inflammation creates inflammation pain and that is one of the things that leads to this pain so these are mainly painful procedures but they're not painful pathology not necessarily that they're unstable but 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 just to bring that into a 
uh, a margin that you can kind of go arthroscopically and then you know subsequently come back and and treat that margin in there and create a stable flap so you don't have much of a of the flapping leading into leading into the pain. Let me see if I can get this. The central lesions are often degenerative and associated with ulnar impaction syndrome. Uh, and this is where the aphyseal shortening of the ulna prevents recurrence and symptoms. Either it can be done through a wafer procedure, depending on how much degree of, of variance you have, and plating multiple locations. Uh, you can look at the literature. But definitely, we do combine them with arthroscopy, uh, assess the luminous arcuito through the CRV, you know, 6R view, and also know for the reactive synovitis. Um, and one of the things is this leads to the peripheral tears. These are usually well vascularized, they're repairable. Indications for repair is usually greater than 50% of the articular disc capsular insertion. Sometimes with these, you can actually let the suction, and if you're doing a dry scope and then suction into it, they'll bring the peripheral tears into the field of view. Um, one of the things is that there's new data that in some of these peripheral tears that are not unstable, maybe just a debridement then a repair might be the same. And the, 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 you know, the jury's still out if we always have to repair, do these capsular repairs aside from just debridement and taking that source of pain. The timing of repair, there's always consideration. We know that there's negative predictive factors, uh, negative DRJ tests, meaning that they they have negative owner cited symptoms compared to the you know in those TFCC tests that we talked about, female gender, longer duration of symptoms. But mainly, it's in these patients usually present delayed in our clinic, and it's not necessarily that we can treat them and address them, and that gives a long uh, poor outcome. But basically, it's just the tissue quality that you have to work with with dictase. We can have patients that show up at eight, nine months and have good tissue quality for the you know, reconstruction, debridement, or however we end up treating, and they do fine. So I think this is something we need to, that it doesn't always behave. But we know the sooner we get to them, the better they tend to do. And it does have a pretty good satisfaction rate of 98%. Either they repair to the capsule or reattach to the foyer. I think this is hopefully with the clinical exam pearls that we've discussed. It's something to look for. Also look for that subtle instability because in those subtle instability, they may just present with a central tear and do probe that central tear because you will be amazed at some of these in younger patients that have central tears that actually are, have a, a foveal detachment. And that comes to the iceberg concept, which is modify the classification of Palmer. This may kind of look overwhelming, but it's a pretty uh, straightforward uh, classification and the biggest the concept is that, that we're seeing with the styloid is just the tip of the iceberg and the deep portions is what actually is controlling the stability which we just already mentioned and this leads to at say's classification from Italy and Lucchetti and basically they broke down with regards to instability or 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 in, in, in that respond to treatment so they look at clinical assessment radiographic assessment and then they assess them arthroscopically what they were able to define was that in their first three classifications, they either said this was these tears were repairable and they had excellent healing potential. They were either superficial fibers, deep fibers, or both, and these were repairable. So meaning we had good tissue to work with. The next four and five classifications had poor healing potential, and they had either they were not repairable, or they had failed previous surgery, or they had significant arthritis at the disarray or in joint. And these are basically the classification that that basically has supplanted Palmer. And this is it may look overwhelming, but it's actually pretty straightforward. The peripheral tears, just remember these 1B tears. Uh, sometimes they, we go in with the scope and they're just kind of looking behind your mirror because subsequently they're right behind you. And you have to be mindful of how either assessing your portals to make sure that you don't miss it, this dorsal peripheral tears. And again, this is usually a typical location. But what, so you kind of have to kind of reposition as we're coming in dorsally for these peripheral tears. You'll have a significant reactive synovitis. And when you have this, you have to debrief this and, and go ahead and de delineate it. And eventually you'll be able to define the tear as well. The capsule re repair technique, uh, inside out, outside in, all inside or behind the back, however you feel comfortable. Uh, there's data that if they don't have instability and we just debrief it, they'll be just fine. But most of these, especially if they have the capsular tear in my practice that extends in that MRI view that I showed you into the, the distal, basically head of the owner into the lateral side, I do all the in this inside out techniques repair as well. This is my preferred technique as mentioned. It's just multiple sequential steps. 
uh, using meniscal menders and using either a non-absorbable suture to reattach these caps or tears down. Important to note, you know, when we're looking at these, you're only looking at superficial TFCC tears. They're only visible through the radio. You know, you have to either do uh, go through the central tear if they do have or develop a DRJ portal and look for signs of instability in that MRI, as mentioned. Why? Because we have to reattach those to the full repair and those will do better. And, we, and that folio is basically the isometric point that leads to that repair. However, we you end up doing either open or or arthroscopically assisted is your surgeon's choice. The data doesn't really combine, say went one favor than the other. Um, it's just what if you're able to do it, do it right. And these are showing the open technique, the arthroscopically assisted, which is what I tend to do in my practice, but opening and getting a good repair will work as well as long as it's done correctly. One of the good articles uh, that I mentioned, this is one of the techniques I use is um, that was published not too long ago. And it does combine an open, putting your sutures in arthroscopically and then completing the open repair. And this really has helped my practice in this open assisted. And we have newer anchors such as the Arthrex ankles and different things, no conflict of interest, but that make these things a little much easier. And this is something for you guys to reference as well. The radio side TFCC, we're almost done. This debridement uh, literature tends to favor debridement. If DRJ instability, then address the instability. And again, if it's in unstable, it does involve the volar dorsal radial nerve ligaments and they need to be addressed in some some form of treatment. Other procedures that are, uh, tend to go is just with the ulnar diaphyseal shortening uh, that tend to be with ulnar plus. Usually this is also in the type 2 polymer classification where it's degenerative that also consists of the wafer and the limited ulnar head resection. If we look at the literature, uh, one of the things if you look at open versus arthroscopic, uh, no significant differences in objective and subjective outcomes. Just whatever you end up doing to your patient uh, in the sense of treatment options, do it well. Uh, I think the open technique, you know, we tend to do a lot more arthroscopic, so the open technique, uh, not all everybody's exposed to, so I think that's why we're not seeing it as much, but it's, it does work well as well. So I think if you look at the data and these, they were not able to show and they did have about a 17% total reoperation rate. And at that time, it was because of the instability. If you look at tissue ability that I mentioned, sometimes you go in where it don't have any subsequent um, tissue to work with. And this is you know one of the things that has stood the test of time. And this outcome of the Adams Berger ligament reconstruction was recently looked at in 2019. And, and they were able to have a pretty good success rate approximately 87% in their in their patient population. And what they found was that those that had basically about 86% at five-year follow-up, they were doing remark they were doing reasonably well. And those patients that were female and they had an interference screw were the ones that had a lot of more complications did not do as well. But the age, the timing of surgery, the type of graft, the sigma notch anatomy, previous surgery did not affect the revision rate or failure rate. So if you tend to do these now, just tie it over the distal end of the bone as the biotinodesis screws that was used in this over the years did have more complications. Early results in, in children, adolescents, I think the adolescent TFCC, it's a little different animal. And these is where actually the owner of the FSL shortening really does come into play. So those when you're treating adolescents with TFCC, don't forget the FSL shortening because and those that with those sudden instability, this is one of the things that I tend to short more than not um, in this patient population. In summary, I know it's a whirlwind. We'll have it um, available for reference in our uh, hand fellowship folder. But you know, central tears, debridement, owner shortening, uh, plus or minus, uh, debridement or repair at the radial side, uh, repair if we have in the periphery to repair the capsule to the folio, depending on our clinical exam and instability. And again, from acute to chronic, the poor healing potential is just a tissue availability, what we're able to offer with these injuries. And I think that's what I have. Do I have any questions? Great talk, Great talk. Thank you, Linda. Great talk, Cesar. I want to ask you, after uh, repair, let's say you do an uh, inside-out repair, uh, how long do you mobilize them and uh, what do you use for immobilization, Cesar? I am using a monster splint. I do immobilize them two weeks in a monster or long-arm splint after surgery. Uh, 
and then I put them in a monster splint or cast, depending on the patient, for another four weeks. So total immobilization period between six and eight weeks. Um, just because uh, I do think even with the capsule repair or as you know, some of these is part of the immobilization is what we're treating that response, the synovitis, the painful issues, because it's more of a, a reactive than just a growth instability. And I think the immobilization does have a big part in these. Yeah, I agree. I do about the same. Yeah, the biggest thing in my practice is looking for those subtle instabilities. Uh, because the ones that that have failed or don't do well are these young patients that have these central tears that have residual subtle instability, and those do need a full wheel repair. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Cesar. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, hope everybody has a great day, great morning, great week. <laughs>